I'd like to welcome you all to Calvary Bible Chapel. Uh, it's good to be here today. This is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We are on our second part of a study on the Holy Trinity, one of the main doctrines of the Christian faith. It is uh, difficult, as we've already talked about, difficult to fully understand or comprehend. And there are many doctrines like this of the Christian faith. Uh, I still think of my personal salvation and how I fought to try to understand it. And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 <clears throat> uh, greatly helped me because it said, says, for, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I had to take it by faith that my salvation was through Christ, and that he was the complete, perfect offering for my sin, and to see that there was no work that I could do to earn salvation. By faith, we come to that assurance, and it is by faith that we need to take God's word at what we read about the Holy Trinity, the plurality and the unity that we see uh, very well presented in Scripture. I think that we don't have to totally understand it. We need to believe it and know that God said it. And that should be enough for us. How do we explain it? We can't. But we need to take it in our faith and at heart. So last week, as we started this message, I did bring to mind uh, two areas uh, that I use as reference. Uh, one of them was uh, John MacArthur's uh, article, his section on the Trinity. I did copy that for you. It's on the back table. Wonderful message. Very accurate in everything that he wrote in that article. But I have to caution you that there are some things that he teaches that I can't fully uh, agree with. Uh, they have to do with uh, Calvinism. And so I don't want to say that I totally endorse everything that he has written. I also want to mention to you that uh, last week that in my studies um, I did check one, uh, one verse, John 3.16, in 45 different Bible translations. And I did that because I have a loved one that keeps telling me that every Bible's different and how can you believe any of them when they're all changed and, uh, and how can you trust those. And so t for my own peace of mind, I took John 3.16 and compared that in 45 different sources and I'd have to say that I didn't see anything that I could totally disagree with, but let's keep in mind I'm not a pastor and haven't studied the Word as, as much as I would have liked to, even though I've been saved for 50 years. But the bottom line is, is that I don't want to come across as that I'm endorsing all these other Bibles. I'm coming across that I like to check things, and if somebody does say a scripture to me that they don't agree with, I can uh, go to this myself and compare scripture with, uh, with what I hold to be true and what others are saying. So very important, I just want to caution you not to believe the way every Bible is written. So in our two-part uh, series, uh, we are looking at the Holy Trinity. Keep in mind that Trinity stands for triunity. So right away it's trying to tell us that there are three in the tri part and trinity. Uh, the second part of that is uh, unity. So we have been stressing this in our, in our message. We are on point three talking about the plurality of Christ, of God, and the Holy Spirit. We saw last week the plurality in the creation and today we're going to start on the a second part of point three, which is the work of the triune God in salvation. Uh, for today, I think I have like every verse on the screen uh, so that we can hopefully quickly go through this message. It could easily be longer, so I should stop babbling. So the first uh, uh, thing I want to draw you to is this slide that I got from Middletown. And we see that 
each part, each person of the Trinity shares a role in the uh, salvation. We saw it in creation. The Father planned our salvation. The Son purchased our salvation and the Holy Spirit personalizes our salvation. Let's take a moment to look at these verses. In the very heart of this uh, is a verse selected which does a very good job. Um, so let's go to what this verse says and the others. It says, for this is the good, 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 5, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Here it's even talking about Christ as our Savior and being God, who will have all men to be saved. And so we know God also wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And it's by the Holy Spirit that we're able to understand the scripture. And for there is one God, one mediator between God and man, and the man Christ Jesus. So we have all three mentioned right here at the beginning as uh, for our salvation. Uh, the Father each has a distinct role in salvation. Remember, they're a trinity, they, they work together, they mutually agree, and so they are equal in power, equal in authority, and the, again, that's something that's difficult for us to understand. In Ephesians 1, verses 3, 3 through 5, we see a verse that gives us where God the Father planned our salvation. So blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, God the Father, hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him, Christ, that he is God the Father, chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, which again is amazing that this was God's plan from the beginning, that we should be holy and without blame and before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, which is to God, according to the good pleasure of his will. I want to also mention when you look at this verse that uses the word predestinated. Let's keep in mind that it's due to God's foreknowledge that he has predestinated us. It doesn't start that he just predestinated us. God knows all things. He knows who will be saved. We don't know that, but God uh, has in his foreknowledge predestinated us to eternal salvation with him. The son in uh, salvation, he purchased our salvation. And what a price he had to pay to purchase our salvation. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Even here my mind goes the precious blood of Christ, that's what redeemed us. But I'm also thinking back to the time in Leviticus where the the angel put the blood on the doorpost and on the mantle so that whoever had that blood upon the doorpost and mantle, the death angel would pass over. And the interesting thing here is that the, uh, the angel putting the blood on those three areas, that was done with hyssop. The blood was on a hyssop. When Christ was on the cross, uh, the hyssop also on the end of the stick there, when they gave him uh, the, the wine, to taste, uh, that was also hyssop. So we see a good analogy between those two, the blood of the death angel uh, coming to cover us by the blood, and then the symbology with Christ and the hyssop um, on the stick. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit played a role, or plays a role in our salvation uh, because he personalized it. It says, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That would be the Holy Spirit. So here we see the Holy Spirit in the role of salvation, and he sanctifies us daily. He sets us apart, <clears throat> and we're justified, of course, by the name of our Lord Jesus. 
we need to read the scripture we've already read that <coughs> excuse me that in the scripture it says but the natural man cannot understand the things of the word of God it is by the Holy Spirit that teaches us now this is a, a very good slide it talks about the other ways that the triune God works in salvation and so we can look at some other verses of the, by the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, the Father planned our salvation. He sent his Son. He gave his Son. The Son did the actual work of salvation. The Son was the great Savior. And the Son died to provide salvation. And the Holy Spirit gives the saved person a new life and a new birth. And he garnishes us and makes the sinner beautiful by placing him in Christ. Let's take a moment to look at these verses. And I'm going to highlight the key words in each of these verses. So uh, we are on uh, uh, point three. I think I... Nope, this is... Yes. Uh, okay, I'm missing some slides. So... Let me just go to these myself quickly and let me tell you how they, how they read. The Father planned our salvation and we read in uh, Romans 8 verse 29, For whom he did for no, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. We see that God sent his Son it says, God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might through him in, his love, in this love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. So this would be 1 John 4, 9 and 10. We also see that God's part in the salvation was he sent his son. John 3, 16, you're very much aware of. He gave his only begotten son. And in John, uh, I'm sorry, Romans 8.32, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. So the father's role in salvation. The son, the work of salvation, John 17.4 and 19.30. It says, I have glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work you gave me to do. The Son, obedient unto death, as we see, a sacrifice for us. On the cross, he said, it is finished. We know that the work of salvation was complete. We also see in uh, Titus, it says, uh, We await the blessed hope and glorious appearance of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. And we see also in 1 Timothy 2.6, he died to provide salvation, and we see this. He gave himself a ransom for all, and this was the testimony that was given at just the right time, as Scripture says, a ransom for all. You know, I thought about that word today, ransom for all. A ransom is something that you give or that you pay for something that you're going to receive. And the thought hit me that Christ died on the cross, a ransom for my soul, a ransom for me. And did he get what he paid for? Did he get the ransom? He did that for us. And so I'm sitting here thinking, am I even worthy of that ransom that he paid for, my, for the cost of me, for my salvation, and for your salvation? And he did that. He died for us. The Holy Spirit uh, gave us the new life. In 2 Corinthians 3, 6, it says that uh, and he was qualified, he has qualified us as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. The letter is the letter of the law. He qualified us not by the law, we couldn't be saved by the law, but by the spirit. It says the letter of the law, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. We also know that the Holy Spirit has saved us and given us the new birth. And we can see this. In um, John 3, 5 and Titus 3, 5. Three, yes, 3, 5. And it says uh, in 3, 5, Truly, truly, I tell you, 
No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. We see also through the washing of new birth and by the renewal of the Spirit that we are uh, made whole by the Holy Spirit. Our righteous deeds uh, we had not done, but according to his mercy through the washing of the new birth and renewal of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit places us in Christ. He garnishes us and makes the sinner beautiful by placing him in Christ. And thus he provides him with beautiful garments. That's us of redemption, sanctification, and justification. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And we also see in verse 11 that, um, of Corinthians 6, 1, 1 Corinthians and that is what some of you were, but you were washed and were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. All three plays a role in our salvation. Now we're going to leave point number three and go to point four and uh, move along. This one, uh, we're going to move a little quicker. And so, a threefold description of God's holiness. A few verses that can come to mind uh, certainly is Isaiah 6 3. Uh, Mike uh, mentioned this just in the last week or two in his message. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And while some would say, Well, is this really a view of the Trinity? I think if you back up and you just look at verse Isaiah 6, 8, and it says, Also I heard, Isaiah speaking, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And this is where we look at the holy, 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 who will go for us? And then Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. Uh, other scriptures that uh, can show the holiness um, of God. We'll look at now the holiness of God the Father. We looked at the holiness of God the Son. Holiness of God the Father. It says, and now, yeah, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to see thee, Holy Father, keep through, keep through thine own name those who thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. There you have a picture of not only the Holy calling God the Father, Holy Father, but also saying even the Trinity, that they may be one as we are one. Just to, just, you know, as I looked at all these scriptures, it's like I've read these for 50 years, and I think um, in my own mind, God was revealing the Holy Spirit to us all through Scripture. I think it's nice when a pastor would say, you know, this is a beautiful picture of the Trinity at work. And I think uh, maybe unknowingly to you, you've read all of these verses before, but has it really hit you that we're talking about the Holy Trinity here? So that's, uh, that to me is a blessing. Uh, to see this revelation that all through my life I've been reading the Scriptures, but to see them really in one concise area, speaking of the Holy Trinity. We also see the holiness, again, in God the Son. In Hebrews 7, 26, it says, And for such a high priest became us, who, Christ, is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. And in Luke 1.35, it says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the holy and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing, Christ, which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. Again, just in this scripture here, we see the Trinity. But the focus I'm trying to make on this verse is that Christ is that holy thing. And so we have the holiness of God the Father, God the Son. And now we go to the holiness, yes, uh, seen in God the Holy Spirit. I love this verse of David's in Psalm 51, verse 10, 11. Create in me a clean heart, O God, 
and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Yes, the Holy Spirit was active in the Old Testament, but as we have learned through other messages, the Holy Spirit was not in people all the time. He came and visited people. And now today, if we look at John 7:39, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive the Holy Ghost, uh, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So now we have that wonderful privilege, blessing, that the Holy Spirit indwells in us. When you became saved and you, you became a new creation, it's the Holy Spirit that has opened up the scriptures to you. And so that's why we continue to learn. Thank the Lord that we don't have to wait for the Holy Spirit just to come upon us to teach us. He indwells us. We can now go to point number five. We looked at the holiness of God through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And even the name Spirit starts with holy, so it's announcing he is holy. So we're now to our fifth point. We've looked at the Hebrew word for God, which is Elohim. And I wanted to mention that, in case I didn't mention it last week, in Mark 13, 19, we do find Elohim used in the New Testament. So I mentioned this, I believe, before, but Mark 13, 19, it's speaking of the tribulation. It says, for in those days there will be tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of creation, which God, the word God in that verse is Elohim, uh, created until this time nor ever shall be. So when we think of Elohim, yes, we looked at it as both uh, the I am being a plural word. We looked at it as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Very first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God, and that word is Elohim, and we saw that also in the Hebrew. But we also saw that Elohim is used in a plural sense, but that was when it was talking about false gods. So the word Elohim does refer to gods, but rather than use gods uh, uh, all the time, it has to be used when it's false. We talked about in the context of the sentence is how you know whether speaking of God Elohim or the false gods. We looked at plural pronouns used to describe the one God uh, let us go down at the time of uh, Babel, Babel um, the plurality, Deuteronomy 6.4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord God, God Elohim, uh, was one of the verses we looked at. We looked at also Genesis 2.24 for a plural unity as an analogy to that. And it says, Let us go down, the people are, are one. And then we also saw, and uh, that was Genesis 11, uh, 5 through 7. We also saw in Genesis 2, 24 about the husband and wife. And it speaks the husband and wife is one. And so hopefully from that we can see that there is plurality. There's plurality in the triunity, but there's also plurality between a husband and wife. The two are one. We see that in scripture. We see a plurality when it speaks of let us go down. The people have become as one. And... Um, the third area, plural pronouns uh, used to describe God. Uh, I mentioned this, I believe, already. The Lord God uh, said, let us go down. The people are one. I just read that. That would be under plural pronouns. So the other one was just uh, was the plurality, plural unity. Uh, point three is plural pronouns. So we have to look at the pronouns like let us go down. And then... Um, uh, four, the threefold ascription to holiness. We just looked at that one. And now we're going into the Old Testament distinction between the triunity as divine persons. So the Old Testament does give uh, quite a distinction between each of the three persons. We saw it in creation. We see it here in verse 1. We see the plurality of God, Elohim, which was the first verse of the Bible. 
And, it's, and we also see the Creator, when you look at verses uh, 3, 6, 9, 11, 14, 20, and 24 of Genesis chapter 1, you will read that the, each verse starts with, and God said, and God said, and that's what, well, that's the beginning, those are the days of creation. We also see uh, the Spirit of God at the beginning of creation, it says in the Genesis 1-2, we see the Spirit of God in the creation as the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. So we're looking at this distinctness of each person of the Trinity. And we also looked at uh, Jesus, the divine builder, and all things were made by him who created all things by Jesus Christ. We can also look at a few more verses of each of the divine persons of the Trinity. Remember that is the focus that we're looking at. We're trying, we're trying to understand the triunity and scripture is, is giving us this and helping, helping us to discern it. And remember that the Holy Spirit and these mysteries are a progressive revelation. So it wasn't just one verse. And so not to just take one verse out of the Bible, but we have many verses that help us to understand this. It says, uh, verse, uh, we see a fourth point. We see Jesus, the Messiah, God with us, the mighty God. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. A beautiful verse. And the word, of course, Emmanuel means God with us. The Messiah being with us. Here Christ is God. And we know that uh, uh, we see this in other areas of scripture. We can look at Micah 5.2. It says we see Jesus, the eternal one, in Bethlehem. Uh, the child is born and he has been from everlasting. So Christ was not a creative being. He was from everlasting. The three are one. Now, a sixth point would be. Jesus, our Savior and righteous servant. And if we looked at each of these areas of Scripture, we would see that for by him the iniquities of us all were covered by his, uh, by his uh, crucifixion. A couple other areas of the distinctness between the divine persons. I have to mention that Messianic Psalms are psalms that speak not only in the Old Testament, but they speak of the Messiah in the New Testament. They are referring in each of these chapters, 2, 8, 16, etc., you will find the same words in those chapters placed in the New Testament uh, re referring to Christ. And that's why they're called Messianic Psalms. In verse, uh, point number seven, we see God the Father speaking to God the Son, thy throne, O God, God here is the Messiah. God, the other God, God the Father, hath appointed thee, God the Son. This is in Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. But you'll also find this in Hebrews 1, verse 8. We also, point number 8, for seeing the, the distinct persons, we see the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, where it says the Lord God, then it goes on to say the Spirit, as in, in me. And so let me, um, let me just read one of these. Uh, the last one. The Spirit of the Lord is appoint upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty, li liberty them that are bruised. Uh, we also see the uh, let's see which one do I want to read uh, come ye near unto me hear ye this I have not spoken in secret from the beginning from the time that is that it was that there am I and now the Lord God and his spirit hath sent me we see the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit with this we can move from these points of each of these, uh, the Old Testament makes a distinction between the divine persons. Each one has a role in salvation. We see their work in creation. 
We see the divine persons. We see it throughout Old, Net, Old Testament and New Testament. We see it through all the Messianic Psalms, the distinction of, of Christ and God and appointing him. We get to now our final point, and that is the New Testament, how it speaks to us of the unity and the oneness of God the Trinity. So in this little square up here, we've seen before, we have the tri, the plurality of God. We see also the unity. We see that there are one God uh, here in the heart of the triangle and in the heart of the circle. And the Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So point number six, our final point, uh, one God and three distinct persons. So let us go to uh, Mark uh, verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 29, and it's Jesus is speaking, and um, it says, And Jesus answered him, saying, The first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So we have the unity, one God. In John 6, 27, it says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which it endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him, Jesus, hath God the Father sealed. So we see the unity there of God. Uh, we see the, this spoken of by Mark and John. Uh, we see also uh, where the Apostle Paul In 1 Timothy 2, 5 and verse 3, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. One God, but in three persons. We also see Paul speaking. Well, let's look at John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. We see the unity, all three in one. Paul in Romans 9, 5 says, Whose are the fathers and whom is concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. And Thomas said unto him uh, in uh, John chapter 20, 28, And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Referring to Christ being his Lord and his God. I'm going to just ask that the Holy Spirit work on you on these verses. I'm not sure that I am doing as well as I can to even cover these and explain them. But the Holy Spirit is who teaches us. And these are the words that are given to us to help us understand the unity but also the tri-unity of God. I had some announcements show up on my computer that this is not the time to read them. Okay. Okay. It's not letting me move on. Okay, let's try this. Mm -hmm. Excuse me one minute as we have technical difficulties. The what? Okay, did it move? Okay, so let me go back. Okay, this is not the one I want. Okay, this is the one I just showed. This, did I show this one? Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, Lord. One more. Thank you, Lord. Each person is distinct. Uh, each one and each verse we can see is different. Uh, the Word, in John 1.14, the Word was made flesh. We see the Father and Son are one. So here's a verse that shows 
each are distinct. What I'm trying to say here is that some would say that there's really one God, but he's actually, sometimes he's God, and sometimes he's uh, the Father, sometimes he's the Son, sometimes he's the Holy Spirit. And this verse is showing us definitely that they are three distinct. It's not just God appearing as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So they are distinct. And for those that, through other models where they try to show that we believe in uh, three different gods or that we're pantheistic, uh, we are not. It is one God, but, uh, but three distinct persons. And so they don't exist as the Father doesn't exist in three different ways. Uh, so this verse here it tells us that they were uh, the Father and the Son are one. And uh, let me go to that. Uh, verse 44, John 1, 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For those who believe grace comes from Mary or some other source, here the Bible clearly tells us that grace and truth come from our Lord. John 10.30 says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him. And again, we see that they are each distinct. The Father was present, the Son was present, and the Holy Spirit was present. We also see in these scriptures down here, all three are spoken of uh, again. Uh, as I think I mentioned this, uh, maybe I missed this. Uh, Luke 1.35, um, I'm going to do like Mike's line because I appreciate when Mike says this. I apologize, you know. So um, anyway, sometimes it's hard to get your mind covering all things at once. And unless you're up here, I don't think you can appreciate that. I highly encourage each of you to speak in public. Okay? All right. Uh, all three were spoken of distinctly here. And these are just beautiful verses. Luke, Luke 1, 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, one person, and the power of the highest, God the Father, shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing, which is Jesus Christ, which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. All three distinct and in one area of scripture. John 14 Verse 16, we're going to see where Christ will send the Comforter. Mike mentioned this just in the past couple weeks or so. It says, uh, Christ is speaking. He says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever. You know, while Christ was here, he was the Apostle's Comforter. They didn't need anything else, but Christ, knowing that he was leaving, was telling them, I'm going to be gone, but don't worry about this, because I'm going to send the Comforter. And they needed to hear this, because they were just going to be lost. Uh, but did they fully understand this? And they didn't, because the Holy Spirit had not been revealed to them yet. Uh, we also see in John 15, verse 26, again, Christ says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Again, the progressive revelation that we see, uh, I even had the thought that here were the apostles, all of this was new to them, they have seen the Old Testament scriptures, but it did it all really click with them even. And so I think it's amazing that all of a sudden it's like, Wow, I see it all now. It's kind of like looking back on your life and you see how God has led you all the way. And so uh, it's amazing how if God had revealed everything we were going to go through, like for me 50 years ago, I would have probably died. Of course, then I'd been saved and been there. But anyway, uh, the thing I'm trying to say is I just think it's amazing that the, uh, the, the disciples in writing the scripture with the Holy Spirit working on their heart, showing them that all of these things were revealed before and now you're seeing them clearer. And so I did spend a lot of time on the Old Testament scriptures because I felt that 
there are those that look at this New Testament and these verses and these things that we're going through. I know of some distinctly that do not believe the New Testament at all. And so we see it backed up. It's constantly backing up things that we're seeing in the Old Testament. At the baptism, we just read this one uh, of Matthew 3.16, how all three were present at Christ's baptism. We only have a couple slides left, so try and bring some things to closure here. I do want to mention that it's impossible to cover all the scriptures that speak of the Trinity. If we did, we'd be here for quite a while. Uh, just the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the Bible, I forget how many times. The Son, Christ, Father, if you have a concordance and you just put these words in, you will see them over and over and over again. And so you can't really exhaust them and beyond the scope that we can go into. But I believe that what we have looked at, in my heart, it has helped to solidify the three in one. Will I totally ever, ever comprehend it? I don't think so. But I know that by faith I can accept this as I accept my own personal salvation. God is revealing this to me, is revealing it to us. Some other quick verses that we can look at. Uh, two slides to close. Matthew 28, 18, we saw that uh, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost were to go into all nations, preach the gospel, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Second Thessalonians 2.13 tells us to be thanks be unto God, beloved of the Lord, the sanctification of the Spirit. In 1 Peter 1.2 we see that God the Father, we see sanctification of the Spirit, and we see the blood of Jesus Christ. In each of these, we're seeing the triunity mentioned. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All in one verse, each distinct. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. One body, one spirit, one Lord, one God, and Father. All three distinctly laid out. But we also see the unity. Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. Be filled with the Spirit, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks unto God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, all three distinct persons. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6. The same Spirit, the same Lord, and the same God. Those very words right in that verse, those verses. And in Jude 20, 21, praying in the Holy Ghost and the love of God, and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. You have read these verses throughout your time as a born-again believer, and maybe it just never hit you over the head like it did me. Trinity, Trinity, Trinity. And so it just keeps, you know, now that we've had, I think, this message, we're going to be more focused on seeing these in Scripture. So um, uh, in closing, just some closing thoughts at some of the things we started with was how can we fully comprehend the Trinity? And the very simple answer to that is we can't. How can a finite person understand an infinite God? And we looked at the verse in Isaiah, of Isaiah 58 verses 8 and 9, for my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. For as far as, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways above your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. When man tries to comprehend everything that God has revealed to us, how can a finite man, man a person, understand an infinite God? And so when people say, well, I, don't, I can't see God, and, or I'm an atheist, or I don't know, and they're trying to understand him in their own mind. It takes the Holy Spirit in us to reveal this. For the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness unto him. You need to have the Holy Spirit in you. And that's what they need to see. Say, if you really want to see this, you will never totally comprehend it, but it will be revealed to you if you will take the Bible and read it. 
because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And until you're really ready to do that, you're just mentally trying to comprehend all of this yourself and you need the faith which comes from hearing and that hearing can be from reading the word and it can be from, as we learned in Sunday school lesson today, the church. It's our job as we give the word of God to people that they can hear the word of God and acquire faith through the same word. Uh, so we're using the word of God. It doesn't matter what I say. What I say personally and my thoughts aren't important. It's what God says. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, not word of me or you. We use his word. We need to believe what God has revealed even if we don't fully understand. We can't fully understand all these mysteries of the Bible. Keep in mind that the mystery of the church wasn't even in the Old Testament until you get a hint of it in Daniel. And Daniel tells us between the, uh, the 69th week of Daniel and to the 70th week, that, that middle week right in there, that's going to be the tribulation period. Did I say that right, Mike? I think I said that right. Okay. Uh, I need to again mention they are a unity, they are each separate, but they are also equal, as this area says, they are co-equal in power and glory, and they share all of the attributes of deity, each with distinct functions. And maybe I'll follow this message with the deity of Christ, because one of the things that I've also heard and people saying is they believe that Christ is our Savior and they died for our sins, but they don't see him as God. And I can tell you some religions that that's their position. They see him as the Son of God, but not God. So the deity of Christ will teach us about he is God. And that would be a very good lesson. The Holy Trinity is but one of the doctrines that we study and we take by faith. We can't comprehend it. Accept it by faith and ask God to reveal this more to you in the scriptures, in your life. I have never fully understood the Trinity. I'm not sure I understand it uh, fully, but I understand it much better. And uh, through all my life as a Christian, I was taught to believe the Holy Trinity. I was taught probably in second, third, or fourth grade, you're not going to understand it, Steve. And I thought, okay, well, maybe one day when I'm smarter and grown up, I'll understand it. <laughs> but I think I'm grown up. I'm not sure about the other. I uh, want to close with 2 Corinthians 13, 14. I've heard pastors close with this verse, very fitting verse, as he gives this to his church family as they're leaving. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Beautiful verse of the Trinity. So uh, I know I went through a lot of this kind of fast and maybe f fumbled with some of my words. I thank the Lord that uh, this is hopefully be on the video. So if I went too fast, uh, if I mumble jumbled some of this, maybe the Holy Spirit will help you make it sense. So, uh, so I thank you for this time and I'll turn the service over to our pastor. I uh, do want to thank the Lord for this message. Let me pray. This message that the Lord has laid on my heart. Again, I wanted to understand the Holy Trinity more myself, but I wanted to be able to defend the Holy Spirit and to speak and know of areas of Scripture that I can go to to uh, answer others for that question that they might have, that I can give an answer appropriate to them. So I pray in Jesus' name that this word will be blessed and glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.